in three, two, one. I'm Jerry Trubiano, and you're listening to the I Love Shanty Show. Oh, Shanty, are you home? Hello, my darlings, and yes, I am home. Welcome to this very special season opener today of the I Love Shanty Show. And oh boy, do I have a very, not only special guest, but friend to share this moment with me. Let's welcome Drake Nelson. Welcome, Baby Cakes. How are you? Oh, doing fantastic, Shani. Thanks for having me on. Gosh, I am so excited to have you as my first episode of the I Love Shani Show. We've been friends for a lot of years, and I've always adored you. I love your comedy. I love who you are as a person, and I'm just so excited that you're here. So what's been going on with you? Anything exciting? Uh, you know, I, I got a movie coming out in December that I help produce. It's it's called Don't Suck, Ooh. and uh, it's starring Matt Reif, who's like the hottest comedian in the world right now. And uh, it's also got uh, a couple other people. Do you want me to go into it right now? Well, hell yeah, want I want you to go into bit? it. Like, give us a little sneak peek so we can imagine it. I, but I can't right. imagine anybody better looking than you as a comedian, Baby Cakes, because I've actually seen oh you naked, God. and it's 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 pretty hot. Are you trying to get me aroused because it's working? <laughs> well, I'm trying to get you in bed after the show, honey. That's my I love goal. It. <laughs> so tell us about this movie. Give us like a sneak peek so we can imagine. So yeah, so uh, the movie uh, was bought by VMI. A big production company. I don't exactly know what streaming service that it's going to be on, but uh, December first, I believe, uh, it'll be in select theaters in a couple different cities, and then uh, it's going to go to one of the big streaming networks. But it's got Matt Reif and uh, Jamie Kennedy, who's a comedy veteran as well. I've known Jamie Kennedy for a couple years, you know, doing comedy. And uh, it was written by Rick D'Elia, who's another comedian friend of mine. And uh, he uh, is like a comedy mentor, you know, he gave me a lot of breaks early on in my career. And like, I was so fortunate to be able to work on this movie. So it's also got Russell Peters, who uh, is literally one of the biggest comedians in the world. For those of you that don't know, he's an Indian comedian from Canada, raised in Canada. So he's just, uh, you know, huge in Canada, huge in India, the Middle East, Asia. You know, he's probably like the 20th most well-known comedian in the United States. Wow. But like worldwide, Russell Peters is is just like super famous. So like he's in the movie and uh, it's going to be awesome. It's got Jimmy Schubert in it who's another fantastic comedian, tours all over the world. Uh, Don Barnhart out of Vegas, another comedian and hypnotist, comedy club owner. Uh, Harry Basil's in it. Harry Basil was uh, Rodney Dangerfield's writing partner back in the day. He's a director, a comedian. So, like, it's packed full of, like, really funny people. Awesome. And uh, it's going to be awesome, man. Like, um, I was so stoked to be a part of this project and, like, um, you know, it's a movie about stand-up comedy. Like that's that's kind of um, the gist of. I don't want to give away too much. Like I feel like people can Google "Don't Suck" and research about it, <laughs> and uh, you know what I mean. So, but again, Matt Reif has exploded. He's like a modern day Dane Cook right now. So, like I'm sure a lot of listeners probably have seen Matt Reif come up on there. Um, TikTok feeds and YouTube, like he's huge. So we were lucky enough to get him in this movie, man. Like soon as his career exploded, the movie's not even out yet. So wow, just just the beginning. That's just one of the cool projects I've been fortunate enough to work on in the last couple of years. So I've been doing that and uh, some stand up comedy when when the gigs come, you know. So it's been uh, it's been a wild ride. So now, <laughs> how did you get this part? Like, who did you blow or give a hand job to? Because you, know, you and I both come from Bunny Ranch. We just had different jobs there. But I, I know you got that in you. Oh, pretty much. So again, uh, Rick D'Elia is a producer and writer of the film. And um, 
uh, I was trying to move to Vegas around 2021. And um, he told me that uh, this movie was getting picked up. It was going into production like as soon as I was moving. So he was like, dude, I'll get you on as a production assistant and uh, we'll go from there. So like I have a background in film, went to film school and stuff. And then I've known all these comedians that are in the movie for years. So it just worked out beautifully. So uh, I, I was hired as a production assistant, which is essentially just like running errands for you know, people in the movie and other uh, production people. If I need to go to Home Depot or Costco to get sodas and, and getting sandwiches for this guy and picking up this person from the airport and taking them to the hotel. And, you know what I mean? Absolutely. I was doing that kind of grunt work. And then um, uh, they promoted me to uh, uh, produ- uh, producer, uh, associate producer is the official title. So, um yeah, it was it was it was just a blast. So just knowing Rick D'Elia for years, uh, he got me on the movie. And you know, he wouldn't have done that if like I hadn't already been on movie shoots and video shoots and and had a background in film. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it just couldn't have worked out any better. I got to be uh, on set with the director, who's a guy named uh, Raja Collins. Who's, who's a child actor and I was a director. So I got to spend a lot of time just watching how he controls a set. And, I, you know, it was, it was super cool to be, like, on a legit movie suit, uh, 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 you know, uh, shoot with a budget and some star power. And, like, those opportunities are so cool to get over the years because it just, you, you develop friendships with people. So, like, I stay in touch with some of the other producers and stuff. And, like, that's led me to another uh, a bunch of opportunities but one thing i am working on is a script with uh, another producer and actor uh named ross campbell who i befriended on set so like <laughs> he's writing a movie right now it's probably going to get picked up and distributed internationally so he was like drake we had such a good time on don't suck man you want to help me punch up this script and punch up i don't know if you know this shanny but punch up is like adding jokes, right? Oh, cool. So, like, there's been comedians like Pat Oswald who's who's done punch up. So basically, like, he'll get a script and then he'll go through it and he'll just add like jokes. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So I'm working on that right now with Ross, and and that was just like one of fifty things that I've got just from being on that set. You know what I mean? That's really so, awesome. Just a tremendous opportunity. You know. So let me ask you this, you know, do you see yourself continuing forth and maybe, you know, in the next 10 years, like, you know, pursuing the movie business and, you know, you've done the comedy side and you're an amazing comedian. I know you're an amazing cinematographer. You know, you used to run the Bunny Ranch podcast and you're such a professional, nice person. You know, you, I I believe would be, you know, somebody who definitely stands out in the movie industry because of you know, who you are. So do you see that career growing for you? I would love to. And, um, you know, the thing is about working in Hollywood, it's all about like what you did before you got uh, the the next opportunity. What have you worked on? So you got to build your resume, build your credits, your IMBD page, you know what I mean? So um, now that I'm starting to develop that, you know, it's, it's like LinkedIn. So like, if you're applying for a job, they're going to go to your LinkedIn or whatever and uh, and and see if you're legit. So now I'm getting these credits. You know, uh, it helps every time you meet somebody new. So yeah, I would to make you know make a long story short. Like I would love the opportunity to work in film. You know, be in front of the camera, or behind it. You know, it's it's an amazing industry. It's so much fun. And and the whole thing about making a movie is being able to create, right? So, like, I've had some really cool jobs in the past. Like, I used to be a video editor and producer for uh, Channel 8 News in in Reno, which was the TV station that I grew up watching, which was, like, super cool to get the opportunity cool, to like, work there later. Yeah. And, uh, but, like, in the news, you, you don't really get a chance to create. It's just, like, you shoot a scene, it's on the news, and that's it. So I was always looking for like little things I could do to like be creative. 
and uh, it's few and far between in the news business. You know what I mean? Yeah. But working on a on a movie, it's like the whole thing is about creation, and you know you're working with you know a hundred different people in all these different departments, and you're watching how these like veterans like to solve problems. And, um, you know, you got your lighting crew and your camera crew and your directors and your production people. And it's just so cool that, like, everybody's on the same page. Everybody's, um, you know, uh, had a background in film and they're lovers of cinema. So, like, not only are you, like, working with movie buffs, you know, you're creating something. Um, that, you know, if, if like once a movie is made and distributed, especially now, it's just out there. You just forever have like this, this little, um, pocket of time that you created. You know what I mean? If there's something really cool about that. That's really I know it's awesome. a long, drawn out answer and I'm pretty high right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. If I can, uh, not have to work a regular nine to five like everybody else, like I think that's the ultimate goal for anybody. You know what I mean? Um, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I mean that, you know, and especially doing something that you're so passionate about, right? It's one thing to show up to your nine to five and it's not your passion, but when you can work towards, you know, your goals and knowing that there's a future out there. And like you said, I really liked how you said it, you know, you created a blip of time, you know, I mean, the sky's the limit and, I can totally see you as like a Chris Farley in the business. Like you have such great humor and you're so theatrical. That's one thing that I just adore about you. And I mean, you know, not only, you know, I was thinking when you said, you know, hey, I got a LinkedIn. I'm thinking, where's your OnlyFans page? I mean, my yeah, gosh. I'm, I mean, I'm thinking about it. Why not? Fuck it. I mean, I honestly think that you could have your own OnlyFans page and it doesn't even have to be about nudity. It could just be like fun, sexy comedy where you're doing like a little strip keys or something and nothing's showing. I mean, you know, I would definitely subscribe to you. And here's the thing is, you know, I mean, you are the whole package in my eyes, sweet cheeks. And I have to know, okay, have you been on any hot or interesting dates lately since we last talked? Ooh, good question. Thank you. Uh, not really. I'm seeing a gal right now, and uh, our relationship is super cool, man. It's just you know we're, we're both like I'm 43, so she's she's about my age. So like when you get to into our age bracket, you know you've uh you 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 cut through a lot of the bullshit. So like our dates are just all about fun and and not spending a lot of money. It's all about the experience, you know what I mean. So uh, we did just go on some little. Um, road trip uh, that ended up at a barbecue joint. So we went to this place in Oregon called Gold Beach. Ooh. And uh, it's a small little town, maybe 50 miles sick, you know, north of where I'm at in Crescent City, California. And uh, it was, you know, the, the sun was out, not a cloud in the sky. So we just went up the 101 on the coast. So it's like we got beautiful trees on the right, ocean on the left, and we're just rocking out to music. And uh, we picked this place to eat. It was, I think it was literally called Gold Beach Barbecue. <laughs> and it was just, you know, it was one of these old joints where, like, nothing fancy about it when you're looking at it. But uh, it was just a fantastic meal, you know what I mean? So we met the owner. He came out. He told me his life story, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was it was it was a super cool thing, you know. So um, and then uh, and then I, you know, pretty much like wrapped up the day by uh, telling fart jokes the whole way home. <laughs> so, you know, most people uh, don't get the uh, pleasure of dating a comedian, but when you do, man, like, you know, we keep it, we keep it light, we keep it funny, you know? Well, that's, that's what life that should be. Laughing <laughs> should be part of any relationship, you know? I don't care if it's your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your wife, or even your friends, you know? Um, oh yeah, I I can't date anybody that like isn't funny or like doesn't find me hysterical. Maybe that's like the ego <laughs> of a comedian. Like I <laughs> I kind of need them to laugh, right? Right. But uh, I've I've had some fun, you know, uh, over the years, and I'll meet somebody 
especially like after a comedy show that I perform at, like I've, I've, uh, had sex and dated people way above like, uh, you know, the ball game I'm playing, you right. But, uh, <laughs> if there's no chemistry, then I get tired of it real quick. So like, I've, you know, been in bed with somebody or whatever. <laughs> and I'm like, she is gorgeous, but like, we're just not compatible. She doesn't think I'm funny. She ain't funny. You know what I mean? I do. So, I, chemistry, the older I get, is way more important. You know, I totally understand that because you and I are the same age. And, you know, my dating experience, like I'm looking for what's on my list, right? I need somebody with good humor that's, you know, um, it doesn't even have to be that makes over a certain amount of year, right? I just want somebody that I've got compatibility with. And, you know, and it's like my priorities. Like, I think of my priorities of dating in my 20s. What a shit show. Like, my grandma one time told me, she's like, Shani, your man picker's broken. And I was 24 and I looked at her and I'm like, that is so mean. She was like in her 90s, you know, and I'm like, who says that? But, you know, I actually at this age, you know, almost enjoy going out and seeing people our age because there's so many different maturity levels out there and you just kind of see where people are at. And I've noticed, you know, I like the silver foxes. I'm into the older men, you know, there's something for me that's just like, um, I feel like I almost need like at least a couple years older because like I think about like the guys I had crushes on in high school. They were always like a couple years older than me. so. I'm like, you know, I'm, um, and plus I'm looking for somebody that's open-minded in bed. You know, I don't oh, want yeah. someone that's like missionary position or once we get into, you know, because what I notice about sexual relationships is, you know, like you start out and it's really hot and heavy and it almost seems like after six months to a year, sometimes and not all the time, there can become like a pattern of the same, you know, sex. And, you know, I want to make sure that um, I find somebody that wants to switch it up every month. You know, let's let's try something new and incorporate new things. So I'm a pain in the ass. I might be single forever, Drake. I mean, (laughs) I have such a great relationship with my finger and all of my toys. I'm like, you know, they never mouth off to me. They never tell me no. And they never ask me to take them to dinner. So... Oh, yeah. And you don't have to uh, buy them dinner. And, they, you know, they, they don't have to have that awkward thing of who's paying. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me ask you this. If you had any dating advice from, like, your whole life of dating for our listeners, what would be a few great tips for people out there? Because I feel like, you know, dating is so out of touch nowadays in many ways, like with the Internet. And, oh, yeah. you know, it's like, you know, I... I just try to, you know, just like imagine like if all I knew when I was young was, you know, oh, Match.com and all of these things. I mean, my head would be in twisted a mess. I'm thankful I grew up in the 90s as a teenager and we were out there making out and you know what I mean? Finding each other in person and going to the mall. So what is some dating advice that you can give the listeners? Yeah, it's such a loaded question, too, because, <laughs> like, I'm, you know, uh, we're of that age where we, we grew up, like, I remember being able to walk up to a woman on the street, no matter where I was. I used to hit on girls at gas stations, like the grocery store. And maybe that's because, like, I grew up with, like, a lot of black guys. And black guys in the 90s especially uh, were consistently, like, kind of proving how, you know, like, macho they could be, right? And uh, Well, they got big enough dicks. I'm just kidding. (laughs) What? I said they have big enough dicks, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. They can back it up. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Uh, But, like... So around a lot of those uh, friends that I had, um, it was almost like a skill that like, if you didn't have that skill, there was no way you were going to get a girl because everybody that you hung around with had no problem spitting game. And there's no spitting game no more. You know what I mean? I do. Like, uh, but yeah, growing up, like I would walk up to women 
hey, how are you? You know, uh, my name is Drake. You know, what's mm-hmm. going on? What's your name? What do you, you know? You just start a conversation, and now, like in in twenty twenty three, like if you walk up to a stranger. And you're like, hey, what's going on? You know, like, it's so creepy. You know what I mean? I do. So, it's it's completely changed. So, like, what would be, like, especially with the changes nowadays, like, if we have a listener out there, like, I mean, would it just be to go old school and just walk up to somebody at a gas station and say hello, even though it's awkward? I feel like if we can break the this you know, created weird, invisible wall of awkwardness. I mean, in the 90s, it was so great just taking the chance of walking up to somebody. And like you said, it feels so awkward now- nowadays. And Oh, yeah. You know, so how do we break that? Like, what would be well, advice to break I, it? I definitely... Oh, go ahead. I, yeah, I know what you mean. So I don't think the old days are ever going to come back, <laughs> right? So, like, I think in the future, people are going to have to play this game of, like um being patient you know what i mean i feel like dating apps are good for for little quickies and little sex things you do on the road whatever but uh you know i think in today's world you just got to be patient and uh because you almost have to be vetted by somebody <laughs> <laughs> or you gotta like work with them you gotta work together uh or or like know somebody uh you know, that's a friend of somebody you work with. Like, somebody has to introduce you. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, I think that's just how it is. So, um, you know, <laughs> fucking jerk off when you need to and try and get, you know. <laughs> like, I hate on dating apps how, like, people, and it's going to make me sound sexist, but women, and I only look at women's things, but they'll say, like, not here for hookups. I'm like, what the fuck are we doing on this thing for them? You know what I mean? Like, you know, I do know what the you love mean. of your life on Bumble? Get the fuck out of here. You're not here for hookups. And I hooked up with those are the ones that want to hook up the most. You know? Wow. Just fucking be real, man. A profile should be like, look. I haven't got laid in a while. I'm looking for a fat guy to eat my ass for about an hour on Thursday. So if you could just send me a man. And then they'll say, like, send me a man. Ask me anything. I'm like, you can't send a message until you accept my thing, you know? So. Wow. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> the, the, the days of walking up to a girl while she's checking out melons in the fruit fucking department of the grocery store are over. There's no more pickup lines. <laughs> you just gotta, you gotta wait. You gotta be patient. You gotta wait for your cousin to be like, hey, you should meet this girl, Rebecca, who's a fucking librarian down the street. She's friends. We'll all go out bowling. And then, <laughs> and then you got to walk up to Rebecca during this bowling match. And you don't really want to go bowling, but you're trying to get laid, right? And you got to wait for Rebecca to bend over, and you're going to see Rebecca's ass. And you can be like, God damn, Rebecca, you got to fucking beautiful butt. You can't say that either, right? Because then you even look like a fucking pervert like me. <laughs> so, I love it. You got to go to bowling. You got to stare at Rebecca's ass. You got to pretend it's not staring back at you. And you got to you gotta get the report later from your cousin who set this fucking dumb date up first in, in the first place. You know what I mean? I totally do. And you know what's so crazy to me is like, I remember like five, six years ago when dick pics were like a really big thing. Like I just... You know, like when I would go into my DMs, it would be like, hey, how's it going? There's a dick pic. And I'm just going, if this is the new way that people hit on each other, like take a look at my penis first. I'm just going, oh my God. And I remember like I was like threatening to take all because I got so many dick pics at one point. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to take all of these and put them into little micro pictures. And I'm going to create like some kind of art off of these. And all these guys that sent me a dick pic can go to this like piece of art and try to find their penis. And then while they're doing that, they can look at other men's. I mean, I'm just very thankful that that kind of calmed down in the last few years, you know, because I don't think I've gotten a dick pic 
Um, actually, I did get one a month ago and I just gave the laughing emoji. I just couldn't believe how I was just like, wow, that, I mean, and it, it was a very interesting looking penis, I will say. And so the laughing emoji, um, I mean, he never wait, said wait, another wait, why one. Why was it interesting? Um, it just, like, it had this kink to it. I mean, it literally looked like a lightning bolt for a dick. And I was like, wow. It was like it was all crooked and stuff? Yeah, it looked like a <laughs> lightning bolt. And I mean, you know, working at Bunny, you know, I've inspected a lot of penises. I've, I've played <laughs> with a lot of penises, you know. And I thought I had seen it all to this picture. Now, could it have been photoshopped? Maybe, but I just don't know of anybody <laughs> unless you know of guys who photoshop their dick. And if they do, I want to hear about it right now. <laughs> I think I'd probably send more dick pics if my dick looked better. <laughs> my dick doesn't photograph well, you know what I mean? So I never had that problem of sending it unsolicited, but I'd have to be like, if it was, if it was like nine inches and had veins coming out, and and maybe a lightning bolt like this this crooked dick motherfucker had. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, if I had a big honking penis, I'd probably send it out more. But my dick's kind of my dick is so small it looks like a pair of balls wearing a little dick hat. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> well, that's cute though. I mean, I, and I guess it just you know depends on what you like and what feels good inside, right? Like I'm not one for monstrous penises. And I, you know, it's like, I like reasonability. Like if I think that that thing's going to reach my low back, I'm starting to question things, right? I'm like, oh, yeah. you know, I, I like, I just need just the tip, right? Like I've always loved that saying it. I'm just going to put in the tip and I'm like, perfect. Right. I've never <laughs> argued with that. <laughs> and um, so I guess it just depends on the size that you like. Now, you and I have both watched, I'm sure, some porns where we've seen some monstrous things get shoved inside. And I'm just going like my jaw drops and like, wow, you know, um, but I tend to like the smaller or teeny weeny or average size weeny for myself. So all I can say is if you wrapped a red bow around your penis, it would be the gift that kept on giving for me forever. So I just want to say. Oh, that. good. Cause I'm not packing much. So <laughs> <laughs> you would get along great. I absolutely love it. So now what are your plans in the new year? I mean, do you have a lot of comedy shows coming up? Have you been touring comedy? I mean, and like what's 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 going on with the comedy clubs um over in California and the Nevada area? Do you have anything planned for 2024? I got a couple, just some small shows. So um in November I'm headlining in um Medford, Oregon. Oh nice. And then January, February I'm gonna be in Washington and then another gig in Oregon. And then um, I got nothing else for comedy. So then I'm I'm waiting on a few like writing projects, like I was talking about right uh, earlier. And then um, yeah, that's officially. So I'm you know I'll eventually I get back to Reno and Las Vegas and uh, maybe L.A. Um, and then uh, so I have a day job right now too, Shani. So. It's one of these amazing jobs that, like, I've been so, so fortunate to get that allows me to, like, still be a comedian uh -huh. and still go on the road and shit. It's, yeah. just, it's super cool. So I'm working for a, a casino here in Crescent City, and uh, I book the entertainment, you know what I mean? So I'm booking bands, I'm booking comedians, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, any, uh, any forms of entertainment, so... Like it's super cool to be on the other side and uh, and and pay entertainers out and I in being able to talk to them about gigs and routing them and getting them up there and showing them how beautiful here it is in uh, Crescent City. So um, that's what's cool about that job is like they they like me they like having a comedian in entertainment and I can hit the road whenever I want. So <clears throat> yeah, if. Uh, my agent 
can start booking me some gigs, that would be fantastic. I'll be there. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, I would love to see your comedy live someday. I just know how funny you are, like, off the stage. So I can't imagine when it's intentional on the stage. And I'm like, you know, so that's always been one of my bucket lists to go see you. And how awesome that you have such a supportive job, you know, and um, that not only are you getting to meet and book, you know, talent, and like you said, pay them out. But, you know, I mean, just to be able to have that support system behind you for, you know, what you're working for, not everybody gets that out of a job, you know? I mean, yeah. so you're very lucky and um, and very blessed to have that. So how did it go with the movie? Were they just like, oh, yeah, just go take the time you need for the movie and come back? I mean, that's like great. Well, I I wasn't working with the company when I was uh, working on that movie. So, um, but we did a private screening in Las Vegas, uh, I want to say June, July of this year. And uh, I went to Vegas to see it and the day job was so cool. They were like, yeah, go down and take some pictures. So, you know, they uh, they absolutely love it. So, um, they yeah, it, it, it's been uh, a blessing to have so much support and like, they allow me to create you know like i got a cool boss that like i come in with so many wacky ideas he shoots most of them down <laughs> <laughs> but like he uh he'll, he'll at least let me have the conversation you know absolutely so, yeah, it's been super cool so yeah i'm just kind of waiting on a few irons that are in the fire and playing the waiting game and you know i'm two blocks from the beach up here in crescent city I'm taking care of my uh, my mom and my aunt right now, and uh, we got French bulldogs. So mm-hmm. it's like you, I gotta keep like a, a steady income coming in, right? You know, so got to, got the mortgage, the Frenchies, old old people. <laughs> It's now, been fun though. So I'm living with my mom and my aunt, and they're both getting a little older. My mom's like half deaf, and. Uh, we have a great relationship. She gets scared that I'm in the house. Like, she forgets I live here. So, <laughs> oh. like, I'll, I'll just, like, go to the kitchen, and she won't hear me. And uh, I'll get so close, and she fucking freaks out. It's so funny. Oh, no. Like, I, <laughs> I just scare her so unintentionally, you know. She, she won't notice I'm there. I'm like, hey, mom. She's like, ah! Oh, that is so cute. So, I mean, I mean, that's like really awesome. You know, I'm all about the family structure. And so what is it like for two siblings? You know, so you said it's your mom and your aunt and you, and they're a little bit older. So do they get along really good or do they still kind of bicker like maybe when they were young? Oh, yeah. No, they get along fabulously, oh, that's awesome. you know. Um, they just uh, they sit on the porch and smoke pot and giggle at the universe. Aww. It's so beautiful to see. You know what I mean? That's so, awesome. That is so awesome. Yeah. Now, do you ever practice your comedy? And old and gambling and loving life, man. <laughs> I love that. And, you know, and that's, you know, like, listen, when you get to a certain age, I mean, those are the choices that you have when you, you know, put your nose down to the grind when you're younger, right? And yeah. um, well, that's like so cool. So do you ever practice like any comedy skits in front of your like your mom? Like I know as a mom, like I love it when my kids just talk to me in general. So does she like, oh, yeah, give me some of your new comedy or anything? Uh, not really like full on bits or anything, but like I'll I'll run some stuff by her. You know, I'll run a joke or two by her because she's essentially a comedian that doesn't perform. You uh-huh. know what I mean? So like she could easily could and if she would have taken comedy seriously like thirty years ago, yeah, she'd be like Rita Rudner, man. She was funny. So like uh, I know if she laughs at whatever immature bullshit that I come up with <laughs> that it's going to be funny because she's got a tremendous sense of humor. Well, that's awesome. Okay. And so- then like I'll bring her to shows too and she has a blast and I'll be saying the dirtiest, nastiest <laughs> jokes and she's horse laughing. Oh my gosh. You that's know. so cute. <laughs> that is yeah. so cute. Okay. So I'm going to put you here on the spot. So for 60 seconds, I'm going to have you do and see if you can come up with an on-the-spot comedy skit. 
Okay. So give me a give me a topic at least. Okay. So topic we will say um we'll say lingerie or something sexy. Lingerie. All right, go. Okay. So 60 second comedy skit from you. Okay. So we will start right. out. I will start out the sentence of I went to the lingerie store and this man walked up to me and go. Oh, I don't have like a punchline for that. <laughs> Just I knew this wasn't going to work to 60 seconds of oh, something man. funny. All right. Okay. We'll, we'll keep the clock going. This this counts, by the way, me complaining about the format. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, lingerie is not that funny of a, of a topic. But I tell you what, man, I'm, I'm so excited when I'm with somebody and they say that they have lingerie because it's, it's like wrapping a present. You know what I mean? Like the, the pussy is the present. So like, <laughs> you know, that's, that's the end goal here. So, you know, um, it all kind of looks the same to me. And really, I just want to rip it off. I don't want to like damage it, but it's I don't fancy. have the appreciation for lingerie that some men do. And maybe it's because like when I used to jerk off, I didn't like the clothes. I want to see just genitals in my face. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I, I, like, I like the effort, but uh, I'm just as impressed with like, uh, like a butt plug. You know what I mean? Like I've been seeing a lot of videos of like just women walking around with butt plugs on and some of them light up like a fucking bumblebee or something wow uh, i did not and, know uh, that wow i didn't know you know what i'm talking about uh -uh. they're like they're using butt plugs as like jewelry like an accentuation of their you know like they'll bend over and you can see a little blue light in their butt oh, wow. like a firefly i love it wow i think i would i would i would much better prefer a firefly butt plug or like a tail coming out than like lingerie but i'm a little Fucked up. <laughs> you know, I think it just gets in the way sometimes, and it's so expensive. Like when you go into Victoria's Secret or Fredericks of Hollywood, you know, these outfits go for, you know, like the crappy ones that you're like, oh, okay, I'll look so so in that, go for like $35 on up. You know, so when you're getting something that's like $70. You know, it's like, oh, 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 please be careful with that. I don't want it to rip. I want it to. And it just kind of takes yeah. away the fun of it, you know, where it's like, let's yeah. have some wild sex. And um, now I got to know we have to get back to the anal beads here or, or the butt plugs. Now, I knew that they had the ones that had jewels on them, right, where it made it look like uh -huh. there was a diamond coming out of your ass. But I yeah. had no clue. I wonder what the purpose of having them light up is. I mean, is that, I wonder if it's like for some crazy sex game in the dark or something that we're just. I mean, it would, it would, it would look amazing in the dark. Oh, yeah. You, you know? know? Like, come and find me, you know? Like, literally, right. come. Yeah, play hide and seek. Oh, absolutely. Well, I got to say, for that 60 seconds of putting you on the spot, I'm impressed and I'm very satisfied. Like, not a lot of things satisfy oh, me in 60 seconds, and um, you did a very good job. So, thank you. Um, oh, I appreciate it. So, like, I mean, let me ask you this. So, in the future with you, let's just say that, you know, you end up being this big Hollywood, you know, director type of individual, which I could see you being. Would you only want to direct and be a part of comedies or would you be a part of other type of movies like, you know, drama or action? Oh, I'd love to do it all. You know, um, I feel like comedians have a have some of the best grasp on drama um, than most people give them credit for. So, like, I would love to do it all. I like, I, and you know, I, I think my, I think before I fell in love with stand up, uh, I had fallen in love with movies. So, I mean, growing up in the eighties and nineties, two thousands, like. Um, I'm a fan of every genre. I'm not like a huge horror fan. It's not that I don't respect it. Um, I just prefer like more more real topics, I guess. Yeah. So, uh, I, and I like the feeling, but like my favorite is like action and uh, and and comedy and and real stories. 
you know, gangsters, you know. Um, but some of the uh, horror movies, they're just, they're so kind of supernatural and like not realistic at all. So, you know, but to answer your question, like, yeah, I would, I would dabble in like every genre. I, you know, I have a, I, you know, I can name 50 action movies and 50 comedy movies and, you know, that, that like I would love to make. That's you so know what awesome. I mean? So, um, yeah, and directing, I, I love, I love being able to like see this vision from beginning to end and kind of, you know, uh, manufacturing this universe with all these people these creative individuals that are like putting you know it's beautiful movie making in cinema is so fucking amazing if you think about it oh yeah uh, so yeah um i like to write i would like to have a production company like um like tyler perry and uh byron allen these these guys are comedians and they are the heads of like these mega corporations now that like church and media companies and um they still like do comedy you know what i mean like it's so fascinating to me yeah so you know i'd like to be you know it would just be cool to work in the industry but like as an end goal like megalomaniac like oh i would love to just be the guy on top where people like yo he was a fucking comedian and now he's like in charge of 15 production companies like fuck man <laughs> it would just be cool to like 365 days a year working on something you know you got 20 different tv shows in production and this one's getting sold and this one's in pre-production and this one's in post-production and this one's casting you gotta fly to this city and help these guys cast it you know what i mean it's so exciting to me Oh, absolutely. Now, let me ask you this. So did young Drake ever like imagine like when you were like, you know, 15 years old, like what was it like, you know, did you imagine being a comedian? Did you imagine being a part of the movies? Like what was your, you know, direction back then? Like, or was this just something that is just, you know, came up in your life in the last 20 years that's just been magical? I've always had like unrealistic um goals and a, a, a viewpoint of life like i i never wanted to like stay in line like everybody else i always wanted to it's un, unrealistic fucking fantasies <laughs> so like right out of high school <clears throat> excuse me like uh you know i had thoughts of being a professional athlete like i was so athletic football baseball basketball that i knew that like i could uh you know, go to the NFL or the NBA or whatever. If I if I would just focus on that one thing, but like I think I have undiagnosed ADHD, mm -hmm. so I want to do everything right. So um, my first love out of high school was professional wrestling. So like you know, um, I could have walked on easily on any college in the country as a football player, um, but like. Wrestling was so hot, and I was such a fan in the 90s that that was my first love. So, you know, to to finance dreams, you always have to work. So I'd always have to work, and it would just be cool. Like, I always get, like, cool jobs uh, supporting my dream. So, like, my entire 20s was chasing the professional wrestling industry. So, like, I relocated to L.A. at, like, 21, you know, I started... Uh, researching wrestling schools um during that time i got a cool job again trying to finance this dream mm -hmm. and i was doing security in hollywood for movie premieres and shit so i'm like opening limo doors for steven spielberg and quentin tarantino and oh, brad wow. pitt and whoever you know um i was at the fast and the furious premiere like all kinds of cool shit in around 2000 and then uh you know, figuring out how I can make it in wrestling. So that ate up like my entire twenties was like my wrestling career. So like, uh, I relocated to Northern California, started training with this company. I trained for a year and then wrestled a couple matches, you know, and, or I would manage some guy for a while or whatever. And then while I'm doing that, I'm like going to college and learning how to, you know, uh, edit and shoot and stuff. 
So like, it's, it's just been one thing after the other that's been like creative and fun. You know, I haven't had to have many like ditch digging jobs and shit. Well, that's good. And I mean, I met you at the bunny ranch. So like, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll fast forward to that briefly real quick. So uh, now uh, when I met you, I was about 34 right in there. been doing comedy a couple of years. And I, I met this comedian named Richard Hunter. Do you, did you ever work with Richard Hunter? Yeah, I, I love Richard Hunter. Um, and, you know, he not only did I work with him at the Bunny Ranch, but when I left the Bunny Ranch and went down to the Love Ranch South, he was basically, mm-hmm. is what we had a nickname for him down there. He was like the assistant pimp. But he, we felt yeah. like he was way nicer. I mean, Richard had like a, a calmness and yet a funniness about him. And I absolutely just loved him and him and his little white Prius. I've been in trouble in that Prius so many times. Richard's hard. <laughs> <to forget. laughs> yeah, I love, I love Richard. I have a huge respect for that guy. And, um, he was super cool and funny. So I, like, I knew him for, I, I want to say like a year before I found out he was working at the bunny ranch. And then come to find out, like, he's doing the podcast and the video shows and stuff. And uh, I was looking at it, and it was basic stuff. Like, he didn't have a background in it, but he was tech-savvy enough to, like, get in trouble. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so I looked at his stuff, and I was like, every everything he was putting out, I knew I could do a better job. And, and I knew that, like, he was busy with other shit. So I was, you know, I figured out a way to show some examples of what he was already doing so he could show it to Dennis, Dennis Hoff. Mm -hmm. And um, I made Dennis Hoff like an audition tape, you know what I mean? So um, it was like a minute long, basically just like, hey, here's what you do. I can do it better. I'll make you more money. (laughs) <laughs> you know what I mean? he, he loved it. Yeah, you so, say more money to so, a pimp, he's all about it. You know what I mean? More right, money. Right, right. <laughs> but so stand up comedy uh led me to the bunny ranch. You know, Dennis was a huge comedy fan and he liked having a comedian work for him and again was like supportive of me pursuing it and shit. Mm-hmm. And then he uh he never got in the way of my creativity. So like my video shit, he just loved it. You know, he uh he he saw my vision and uh let me create and I shot all over that place. So but yeah, so like um, you know, I went from from professional wrestling right into comedy and throughout both like careers. Uh, I've had jobs that like support that. It's just been, I can't, you know, believe the luck I've had. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. And I mean, um, what a blessing that is. Now I have to ask you, what is wrestling school like? You know, like I think of like a college campus and like what happens at wrestling school? That's an excellent question. So I'll I'll give you the the rundown of what wrestling school is like. Okay, thank you. Uh, Pain. pain. Wrestling school is basically learning how to condition your body to take the punishment that professional wrestling dishes out. Wow. So, um, you you basically learn. It's like going to any other school that's like a trade school, and you're basically learning how to do basic stuff with any wrestler out there. So um, you're taught like a, like a one style for the most part. And um, you know, which is basically telling a story with your body, right. Mm -hmm. And conditioning it, you know, to take the punishment. And by the way, so like when you take a bump in the middle of the wrestling ring, That's about the same inertia as like a car crash. You know what I mean? Like you ever get in like a fender bender? Yeah. You're like, oh, I'm sore. Like the body's not meant to, you know, um, to fall down the way that like wrestling teaches you. So, um, you know, you you learn how to how to how to bump and 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 fall and not hurt your opponent. And then, uh, you know, you learn a lot of basic stuff. And then, you know, like a lot of jobs, they just throw you out there and you kind of <laughs> figure it out, you know, uh, you'll get, you'll get it after your, your trainer kind of says that you're ready. Uh, then, you know, uh, you, you, 
kind of have some street cred, you know? Right. Um, then you start taking bookings for $25 a match, or if that, you know? Wow. So there's a lot of, like, little details. I don't want to bore your listeners. No. I'll give you, like, like a, like a typical wrestling class, right? So okay. you go in, you stretch out, you do some bump drills, like everybody lines up. Let's say there's 10 people in a wrestling class. Mm-hmm. Um, the trainer uh, will kind of go through uh, some basic wrestling stuff. So, you know, these, there's like 10 or 12 like bumps that every wrestler should do uh-huh. and learn that like if it comes up in a match, you know how to take this bump. So if someone's giving you a suplex, like you know how to land and bump right. If someone's giving you a body slam, you know how to take it and not kill yourself. You know what I mean? Wow. So you, and then um, you'll you'll do these little bump drills, and that's just kind of get the blood flowing, get the sweat going a little bit, and that's probably a half hour in. Take a little water break, and then the trainer kind of will take two people and bring them in. And kind of like walk them through some different scenarios, you know what I mean? And he'll say, "All right, you know, you're backed up into the corner. The baby face, which is the good guy, uh, is hitting you. You know, break his break his uh, momentum, and then go for a slam, and then go for a cover. You know, he'll he'll do these like little drills. You know what I mean? Yeah. So then you do these drills for a while, and then uh, after the after everybody kind of goes through different drill scenarios then you like do like kind of fake matches you know what i mean yeah so the thing about the wrestling business is everybody's real supportive of each other and they're in uh everybody's really respectful the business is built on respect so cool. y- you know like you guys are all hurting hurting yourselves and telling a story with your bodies but there's this irreverent sense of brotherhood in this environment so you know, that's that's one thing I really uh, miss about the wrestling business is, is that like you always have like thirty or forty friends at this wrestling company that you're involved. You know what I mean? Like it's a, yeah. it's a great bonding experience, and you, you're trusting these people to catch you when you're coming off the top rope or or whatever. So like you're putting your uh, you know your life in their hands, and then vice versa. It's not like comedy, you know, where it's like kind of everybody out for themselves. Right. <laughs> you're kind of chasing that next gig. So right now, let me ask you this. So um, like, do, I mean, when you're at school, do you wear like the wrestling costume, or do you guys like practice in sweats and stuff? Because I've always Most loved the costumes. Yeah, yeah. That's another great question. Yeah, most of the time it's real relaxed at like a practice. Uh-huh. So sweatpants, shorts, sh- uh, shirts. And, you know, sometimes people will get like new gear that they just bought and they want to try it out, loosen it up a little bit, write new wrestling boots, you know. But for the most part, it's real relaxed. And and the, the place I trained at um, was very old school. So like at the time, if somebody knew or like somebody that wasn't part of our little wrestling family came in, we wouldn't uh, train in front of them. You know what I mean? We would just kind of all stop because we wanted to protect the business. You know what I mean? We didn't want to like show people how we were bumping. We wanted people to think like we were beating each other up and shit, but we weren't. We didn't want to like show them, you know, all the tricks and shit. Does that make sense? No, it, it totally does make sense. And, you know, like I was, I mean, first of all, the wrestling industry is still very big like I, when i seen that you know snoop dog i think you know i yeah i think it was like snoop dog had went and did a wrestling match i was like you know it just like i remember when i was young you know with hulk hogan and some of those like i mean it was so popular it was so cool and i believed it was all real you know and oh, yeah. these wrestlers do such a great job and when you talk about teamwork you know, I had never thought about like you're depending on that other person to catch you and to make sure that you don't break something or hurt yourself, you know, with these moves. Oh, and, yeah. I mean, OK, now let me ask you this. In like five, ten years, if they were like Cannibal Drake, we want you to come to the WWE. Would you do it? <laughs> well, shit, in 10 years, I'll be in my 50s. Well, Hulk Hogan's in his 50s. You know, well, yeah, but Hulk Hogan has been wrestling, you know, for forty years. He knows exactly what to do in that ring. He's right. in tremendous shape, with or without steroids. <laughs> right? I'm a, 
If I, so, you know, and here's the thing is, is I always still dream of like making a living as an entertainer, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I have some friends that are working for big wrestling companies. And if they really wanted to, or they were, you know, they had an opportunity um, and they reached out, like I would, I would, I would definitely explore the possibility. Maybe not in the physical aspect, Mm -hmm. because like I already destroyed my ankle in a wrestling match, which I don't think I told you about. No, I so that's why. Yeah, that's why I quit. Like the physical part of wrestling is I was wrestling a match in front of like ten people out in Lancaster, California, and I was working with this idiot who was not trained properly, right? Mm. And uh, this idiot fell on my ankle during a during a like little spot in the match and completely fucking destroyed it. Like oh, <laughs> wow. the thing was pointed the wrong way, and I broke it and dislocated it at the same time. Oh my you know, god! Like, yeah, it was nasty. Oh. Wow, kind of surgery and shit. So, but like, I would love the opportunity to do like commentary or uh, or like manage or behind the camera, you know, as a producer. Like, I produced um, my own wrestling television show for a while, Shani, mm-hmm. uh, and it was airing in three states. Oh, like, wow. I, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I have a great sense of of wrestling television production. It got to the point where like wrestling companies were coming to me and I was uh, like consulting them on how to uh, produce wrestling television. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of skills there that like I would definitely consider if if the right opportunity presented itself. I could totally see you involved in that industry on some kind of level, even if it was behind the camera, because you know, you have such a love for it and such an understanding for it. And now I got to ask you this, like, what would be, like, if you had the ultimate wrestling outfit, what would the colors of it be? Because it seems like every wrestler has, like, their own color scheme. So what would your colors be? You know, uh, that's a great question. I would probably, because I was a huge fan and they say this tells a lot about your personality of like, I like some of the bad guys, right? So I'm like a nice guy in real life and I like a lot of the bad guys. So one of the, uh, one of my favorites in the nineties was, was Mick Foley, Mankind. Mm-hmm. And he wore like a brown singlet, you know, like a brown mask on and he was dark and twisted. So like if if I had the opportunity, I would wrestle as like a demonic kind of like bad guy. You know what I mean? Very so black colors, you know, kind of kind of evil. You know, that's kind of my ideal bad guy scenario. I, I like it. when it's when stuff's easy. So like when a guy walks out and you just know he's a bad guy. Like, I like, I like that shit. (laughs) I do too. You know, I always like that uh, wrestler, The Undertaker, you know. Yeah, yeah, he was another favorite of mine too. I mean, he would come out and then his hair would be in his face and like he looked like he was already pre-sweating and hadn't even, you know, stepped into the ring. And I was like, and he just, like, he really had that feeling of this guy is The Undertaker. So, I was just like, wow, but I can totally see like wanting to be like one of the, you know, naughty characters, you know, and something oh, yeah. a little bit more dark. I mean, I, I could totally see that with you. Now, yeah. I got to ask. But they you, say again, like, it, like your, re- your kind of ideal wrestling persona is like opposite of how you are in real life. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. You know, I yeah. could totally see so I'm a big sweetheart. That. That's what I'm trying to say. You are a big sweetheart. <laughs> now, I got to ask you, would would you wear a mask or would you wear a hat or would you just go with the costume and, and not worry about a mask or some kind of I like, would, hat? Uh, yeah, I would experiment. I, you know, I like the history of wrestling, so I love masks. I love it all. I like, I like face paint. I like all that old school shit, you know, sunglasses, biker helmets. I love it. You know what I mean? Like, I would do anything. You I, know? 
That's awesome. Now I got to ask you, so um, where can people like find you so they can keep up with you and like everything you're doing? Do you got a website, social medias? I mean, is there like a glory hole on Sunset Avenue they can find you in and talk to you? Oh, that would, that would be nice. <laughs> if there was. Yeah, go to their glory hole on Sunset <laughs> Avenue. I'll be there from three to four. <laughs> That'd be fun. Uh, I, you know, I had a website for a while, but you know, websites are passe now. No one uses websites anymore, do they? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I uh, got one for I love Shanny and Well, you're professional. Thank you, honey. I mean, I, I appreciate that because, you know, I want to be able to post the links where people can find my guests on my website. And they can go right to you, you know, and yeah, yeah. it's like, and be able to check you out. Like, I mean, I've got a lot of listeners that are in the Los Angeles area. And so, you know, and you're right in their neck of the woods. So, you know, I want people to be able to locate you. Hopefully you don't get a stalker, but, you know, I mean, I'm oh, at least I'm hoping at for a fan or a blowjob. Ooh. That would be nice. What I'm, would you I'm do with a stalker? Applications. Like if you had a stalker and you knew it and the stalker was like decent looking, like, would you have fun with it? Or would you just be like, oh my gosh, I'm like freaked out right now. I have a stalker. I try and fuck him at least once. <laughs> you know? Oh and my then God, see what I happens. I, I, I think, I think that would be a cool, uh, like marriage story. How'd you guys meet? Oh, hey, he, he was my stalker. And then we just started fucking and then got married. <laughs> you never hear that story. No. I would be the first that was like, hey, I had this woman. She was a stalker. And uh, I didn't want anything to do with it. And she threatened to suck my dick. So I let her. And now we're married with four kids. Honestly, I think you have to write a like like some kind of movie about that. Because that right there yeah, would be, be like a really different premise, you know? Ooh, ooh, here's a good premise. Let's, uh, maybe I'll write this, and if this movie gets made, I'm going to be pissed. Let's <laughs> say this happy couple gets married, right? They're married like 10 years, two kids. And then, like, one of them finds out that their other one was a, was their stalker, and they had no idea. Ooh, right? yeah. <laughs> it's like you find out 10 years into a marriage, your husband or wife was fucking crazy this whole time mm -hmm. and you're just now all right i'm gonna write that movie as soon as we're done i am I, i'm so excited for this like i'm at the edge of my seat waiting for you to say your next word so maybe you should just up and pause it because there's i mean this is a really yeah, like, like good, a good premise I it really does like i mean i the only one i can think um is that that movie back in the day with that chick single white female do you remember that movie yeah 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 and I don't think there's been one of those like pr type of premises like out since. And at least it's been with a husband. I mean, usually they show the wives as psychopaths, you know? So I think that that would be like a really like dark premise. I mean, honestly, I could yeah. see that being turned into like a series and not just one movie. You know, oh, but series. like that sounds good too. All right. I'm going to write the series. Okay. I no one, no one steal my idea out there. Yeah, so intellectual property people, like he's got the evidence that he came up with exactly. the idea on I Love Shanny Show. It's just so amazing that we got to be creative and you like summons this amazing new idea from like, you know, the genius gods. And here we are oh, right yeah. now. And when this interview is done, you're going to go write this amazing script. And I hope you make a bazillion dollars and at least invite me to Hawaii so we can enjoy drinks together. That's all I'm asking. Hell yeah. That's the idea. Hell yeah. Well, Drake. Oh, oh real quick. Do you want me, uh, let me oh. plug my, uh, my oh, social yeah. media Yes, quick. totally We're plug crappy. your social media. So easy way is, uh, is Drake Comedian on Instagram. Apparently just Drake was taken. Oh, wow. So I had to go with Drake Comedian. <laughs> and then uh, Drake Nelson on Facebook. So. Find me on those two things, Cannibal Drake on on X, formerly known as Twitter, but I don't tweet much these days. No, um, I I I just can't figure out their algorithms. Like it just I feel like if you're not Elon Musk and you don't drive a Tesla, you're not getting any retweets. So it's yeah. you know. <laughs>
I, I go to X, formerly Twitter, for uh, porn, actually. Like, <laughs> there's so much porn on Twitter. That's what I use it for. That is so surprising, you know, that there's that much porn on Twitter. But, you know. I love it. Yeah, I mean, I guess anywhere where you can get it and you don't have to deal with pop-up ads, you know, because watching porn and dealing with a pop-up ad is absolutely terrible. You know, it almost like it like distracts you. It's like I was about to come and now I'm thinking about something else. You know, I'm thinking so it's very (laughs) difficult. All right, Drake. Well, I just want to thank you so much for coming on to my season premiere. And, you know, I wanted to give everybody a little bit of something old school where it's sassy, you know, still classy, but, you know, bringing it up to speed. And, um, you know, I thought how much fun would this be to you know, still do the interviews of my friends, people in the entertainment industry, bands, but, you know, be able to bring such a, a, you know, I mean, Lucille Ball was such an amazing woman. And, you know, she had so many, you know, different comedy, you know, skits, and it almost seemed like personalities about her. So, you know, I'm just hoping that this show can make you smile, make you laugh. If we can make you smile and laugh, we can make you come. And so that's my um, departing um you know, joke of the night. And Drake, thank you so much. So, and you know, for all of you out there that want to listen to my shows, I'm uploaded to all major platforms. And of course, I will be uploading onto my website, which is www.iloveshannyshow.com. And yeah, check for updates and what guests are coming. And Drake, I will be posting your links um, up on the website. So all they have to do is go there and click on you. And listen, I hope you come back on the show. And of course, we'll always keep in touch. And for all of my listeners out there, thank you. And I will see you all next week. And we have a very special guest next week. And... Yeah, I will be that as a surprise. Check out those flyers. Bye, everyone.